Okay, that works. So, a little bit too high, but can't have everything. Are you back in? Yes. Yay! Okay. Oh, you're between a banana and a juniper. Uh, yeah, and you're visible too. Me? Yep. Where? Uh, right there, because it's, it's kind of covered by the chat. Uh, to move? No, no, you're fine, you're fine there. You can stay in the background. It's um it's only because I've got the uh, maybe if I have the light on the other side I can not ha not, not worry about you being in the shot. No, that's not enough light. Let's get the big light. Sure, why not? Okay. Um, yeah. Like about the light. Oh no, that's very dark. So yeah, I'm gonna have to just cope with this. Is it too bright for you? It's a little bright, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, I hit me feel my thing again. Yep, you do your thing. Have fun. I will. Without the actual problem lights on over there. But oh well.
Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Still can't see. Still can't see who's uh, who's watching the stream. And then I can't see what people are watching the stream. Oh, it's just about two o'clock. I'm still not sure who's watching me. Who's that one person that's watching me? Um, but I guess I should still get going anyway. Uh, maybe we'll wait a few more minutes. Cause I did say that it was going to be two o'clock. Um, and it's just about that time. Um, yeah, so Stanisław Lem was a Polish sci-fi author and he was also a philosopher and a futurologist and uh, yeah, quite a, pro quite, quite a prolific writer. Um, had a very low opinion of American sci-fi apparently, um, started beef with uh, Philip K. Dick. Uh, to the point when uh, where Philip K. Dick reported him to FBI uh, because, of course, uh, at that point, Stanisław Lem was on the other side of the Iron Curtain. Oh, hello, Stevie. Um, cool, yeah. So, uh, aside from that, uh, possibly the most well-known of his... Um, possibly the most well-known of his books is Solaris, which was made into movie three times. Uh, twice by Russian directors and uh, once, which is unfortunately also probably the most well-known one by a Western director um, and it is a movie from I think 2000s with George Clooney and it's not very good. I have tried watching it and whereas Solaris the book itself is a sort of a hardcore uh, theoretical sci-fi 
uh, uh, that is, uh, well, I would I would assume grounded in theoretical physics, as you sometimes get these sort of hard sci-fi books, um, similar to um, even Baxter. But uh, the the movie with George Clooney um, seems to focus entirely on the relationship of the main character and his dead um, partner. Uh, but that's beside the point. Anyway, so um going to start with the introduction to the Star Diaries. Star Diaries is a series of uh, humorous uh, short stories. Um, and uh, yeah, we're going to try and get through at least the first one today and we'll see how it goes and if anyone is interested in time. <coughs> okay, so Stanisław Lem Star Diaries. Introduction. This edition of the works of Ion Tihe, being neither complete nor definitive, does represent a step forward in comparison with its predecessors. Included here are the texts of two hitherto unknown voyages, 8th and 28th. Uh, the latter provides us with new information concerning the biography of Tihe and his family, information which will interest not only the historians, but the physicists, as well as for, point, for it points to a phenomenon long since suspected by me, namely the dependence of the degree of kinship upon velocity. As for the eighth voyage, a team of theologists, psychoanalysts, had verified, minutes before this edition went to press, all the events which took place in the dream of Aitihe. The interest reader, interested reader will find in Dr. Hofstosser's work a comparative bibliography on the subject, showing the influence of the dreams of other famous people like Sir Isaac Newton and the Borgias of the uh, on the dreams of Tihe and vice versa. On the other hand, the present volume does not include the 26th voyage, shown conclusively to be apocryphal. The proof of this can be supplied by a team of workers at our institute who used electronic textual analysis. I might add here that personally I have always considered the so-called 26th voyage to be spurious on account of the many inaccuracies that appear in that text regarding, among other, the oofs, not uh, oops as the, as the text gives, also the gazards, meopticans, and the species of the loafs, phlegmus invariabilis obstophosauri. Of late, certain voices have been heard which would cast... Let me just close the window because it's getting rowdy out. Right. Of late, certain voices have been heard which would cast doubt upon the authorship of Tihe's writing. The press tells us that Tihe used a ghostwriter, or that he never even existed, his works having been penned, they say, by a device given the name of Lem. According to some extreme versions, this Lem is even supposed to be a man. Now, anyone who has a rudimentary acquaintance with the history of space travel knows that LEM is an abbreviation for Lunar Excursion Module, an exploratory vessel built in the USA as a part of the Apollo project, the first landing on the moon. Ion Tihe requires no defense, neither as an author nor as a traveler. Nevertheless, I would like to take this opportunity to quash those ridiculous rumors once and for all. Specifically, then, the LEM was indeed equipped with a small brain, electronic. The device, however, performed only the most narrow and navigational tasks and would have been incapable of writing a single coherent sentence. About any other land, nothing is known. Um, we find no mention of such in the device of catalogues of large-scale electronic machines, viz. Nordronics, New York, 1976-9, nor in the Great Encyclopedia Cosmica, London, 1988. High time, then, that this gossip, out of keeping with seriousness of the work at hand, ceases to distract our theologists from the much labor yet, and many years will be needed to compile the Opera Omnia of Antiche. Professor A. S. Tarantoga, Department of Comparative Astrozoology, Fonalhaut University, on behalf of the Editorial Committee for the Publication of the Complete Works of Ion Tihe and Scientific Council of the Theological Institute in conjunction with the Editorial Board of the Quarterly Tihiana. Introduction to the Expanded Edition 
It is with joy and deep emotion that we offer the reader this new edition of the writings of Ion Tiche, for it includes not only the texts of the Hit Here to Unknown Voyages, the 20th and the 21st, not only the invaluable illustrations by the authors on hand, but also an explanation of certain mysteries that have, till now, given even specialists in theology many a sleepless night. As for the drawings, for a long time the author was unwilling to part with these, claiming that he sketched stellar planetary specimens in flagranti <clears throat> uh, or from his private collection purely for his own amusement. That they possess neither artistic nor documentary value, since he always dashed them off in a great hurry, Yet even if they are scribblings, which, in, with which opinion, by the way, not all experts agree, their use as visual aids in reading of these texts, so often difficult and obscure, is undeniable. This is the first source of our staff's satisfaction. Secondly, these texts of the new voyagers afford no little comfort to the mind that yearns for the definitive answer to those oldest of questions which man has put to himself and the world, namely, who exactly it was that constructed the universe, and why thus and not otherwise it was done, and who was responsible for natural evolution and general history of origin of intelligence, life, and other no less important matters. And it is not a pleasant is it not a pleasant surprise indeed to discover that our illustrious author himself played in that creative endeavour a major if not deciding role. We can well understand the modesty with which he defended the drawer containing these manuscripts, uh, equally well the delight of those of who finally broke down Tihe's resistance. It is here, too, that the reason for the gaps in the numbering of star voyages comes to light. After studying this edition, the reader will not see not only why there never was a first journey of I. Tihe, but also why there never could be, and with a little concentration he will realize the voyage number 21 is at the same time 19th. Uh, truly, this is not immediately apparent, since our author crossed out the last few dozen lines of the manuscript in question. For what reason? Once again, it is tremend his tremendous modesty. I cannot break the oath of secrecy placed upon my lips. I have been permitted, however, to pull aside the curtain just a little. I Tihe, seeing where he attempt, where attempts to improve his prehistory and history were leading to in his capacity as director of the Temporal Institute, did something as a result of which something the, th something the theory of time vehicles and transport never was discovered. Since at his orders this discovery was undiscovered, uh, by the very act the telechronic program to correct history vanished, so did the Temporal Institute, and alas, did I, uh, did I T himself, being the director. The pain caused by the loss is assuaged in part by the knowledge that we will now not have to fear any unpleasant surprises from the past, at least and in part by the startling fact that he who tragically is no more still lives without, uh, without at all person having risen from the dead. Admittedly, this circumstance is perplexing. For its full explanation, we direct the reader to the appropriate places, namely the 20th and the 21st voyages. In conclusion, I should like to announce the establishment in our association of special futurological section, which in keeping with the spirit of the times will make available using the method of so-called self-realizing prognoses. Those star journeys of IT here, which as yet he has not undertaken, nor indeed intends to. Professor A. S. Tarantoga, on behalf of the Associated Institutes of Theology, Tehography and Tehonomics, Descriptive, Comparative and Prognostic. And, right, let me just grab a sip of water. Right, there we go. The Seventh Voyage. It was on a Monday, April 2nd. I was cruising in the vicinity of Betelgeus when a meteor, no larger than a lima bean, pierced the hull, shattered the drive regulator, and pawed the rudder of the rudder, as a result of which the rocket lost all maneuverability. I put on my spacesuit, went outside and tried to fix the mechanism, but found that I couldn't possibly attach the spare rudder, which I'd had the foresight to bring along, without the help of another man. The constructors had foolishly designed the rocket in such a way that it took one person to hold the head of the bolt in place with a wrench 
and another to tighten the knot. I didn't realize that at first and spent several hours trying to grip the wrench with my feet while using both hands to screw on the nut uh, at the other end. But I was getting nowhere and had already missed lunch. Then finally, just as I almost succeeded, the wrench popped out from under my feet and went flying off into space. So not only had I accomplished nothing, but lost a valuable tool besides. I watched helplessly as it sailed away, growing smaller and smaller against the starry sky. After a while, the wrench returned in an elongated ellipse, but uh, though it had now become a satellite of the rocket, it never got close enough for me to retrieve it. I went back inside and, sitting down to a modest supper, considered how best to extricate myself from this situation. Meanwhile, this ship flew on straight ahead, its velocity steadily increasing, since my driver regulator too had been knocked out by that blasted meteor. It's true there were no heavenly bodies on course, but this headlong flight could hardly continue indefinitely. For a while, I contained my anger, but then discovered with, uh, when starting to wash the dinner dishes that the now overheating atomic pile had ruined the very ma my very best cut of sirloin, I'd been keeping that, keeping it in the freezer for Sunday. I momentarily lost my usually level head, burst into a volley of the vilest oaths, and smashed a few plates. This did give me a certain satisfaction, but was hardly practical. In addition, the sirloin, which I threw overboard instead of drifting off into the void, didn't seem to want to leave the rocket and revolved around about it a second artificial satellite, which produced a brief eclipse of sun every 11 minutes and 4 seconds. To calm my nerves, I calculated till evenings the components of its trajectory, as well as the orbital perturbation caused by the presence of the lost wrench. I figured out that for the next six million years, the sirloin, rotating about the ship in a circular path, would lead the wrench and then catch up with it from behind and pass it again. Finally, exhausted by these computations, I went to bed. In the middle of the night, I had the feeling of someone shaking me by the shoulder. I opened my eyes and saw a man standing over the bed. His face was strangely familiar. I thought I hadn't the faintest idea who could it be. Get up, he said and take the pliers. We're going out and screwing the rudder bolts. First of all, your manner is somewhat unceremonious, and we haven't been introduced, I replied. And secondly, I know for a fact that you aren't there. I'm alone on this rocket, and have been now for two years, en route from, uh, from Earth to the constellation of the Ram. Therefore, you are a dream and nothing more. However, he continued to shake me, repeating that I should get wi get go with him at once and to get the tools. This is idiotic, I said, growing annoyed, because this dream argument could very well awake me, and I knew from experience the difficulty I would have getting back to sleep. Look, I'm not going anywhere. There is no point in it. A bolt tightened in a dream won't change things as they are in the sober light of day. Now, kindly stop pestering me and evaporate, or leave in some other fashion, otherwise I might awake. Oh yeah, the sirloin, it's, um, <laughs> it's a satellite now. But you are awake, word of honor, cried the stubborn apparition. Don't you recognize me? Look here. And saying this, he pointed to the two wards, biggest strawberries on his left cheek. Instinctively, I clashed my own face, for yes, I had two wards exactly the same, and in that very place. Suddenly, I realized why this phantom reminded me of someone I knew. He was the spitting image of myself. Leave me alone, for heaven's sake, I cried, shutting my eyes, anxious to stay asleep. <coughs> <coughs> Whoopsie. <clears throat> Sorry about that. You are me, then fine. You needn't stand on ceremony, but it only proves that you don't exist. With which I turned on my other side and pulled the covers up to my head. I could hear him saying something about the utter nonsense, then finally, when I didn't respond, he shouted, You'll regret this, knucklehead, and you'll find out too late that this was not a dream. But I didn't budge. In the morning, I opened my eyes and immediately recalled that curious nocturnal episode. Sitting up in bed, I thought about what strange tricks the mind can play. Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> probably more, more water, yeah. Uh, it doesn't help that my, um, my medication makes my mouth dry in a way. What was that? Because uh, I, I, I started coughing, so I was like, oh yeah, better take some more water, and it's like, because the sertraline makes my mouth dry anyway. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, where was I? Sitting up in bed, I thought about the strange tricks the mind can play. For here, without a single fellow creature on board and confronted with an emergency of the most pressing kind I had, as it were, split myself in two in the dream fantasy to answer the needs of the quiet situation. After breakfast, discovering that the rocket had acquired an additional chunk of acceleration during the night, I took to leafing through the ship's library, searching for textbooks for some way out of this predicament. But I didn't find a thing. So I spread my star map on the table, and in the light of nearby Betelgeuse, obscured every so often by the orbiting sirloin, examined an area in which I was located for the seat of some cosmic civilization that might possibly come to my aid. But unfortunately, this was a complete stellar wilderness, avoided by all vessels, as a region avoided as all vessels. Yeah, no, that's a brief nice, I get that too. <laughs> oh, the fun of antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication and all other um, mental health medication. Uh, possibly come to my aid. But unfortunately, this was a complete stellar wilderness, avoided by all vessels, and as a region unusually dangerous, for in it lay gravitational vortices, as formidable as they were mysterious. 147 of them in all, whose existence was explained by six astrophysical theories, each theory saying something different. The cosmonautical almanac warned of them in the view of incalculable relativistic effects that passage through a vortex could bring about, particularly when traveling at high velocities. Yet here, uh, yet there was little I could do. According to my calculations, I would be making contact with the edge of the first vortex around 11, and therefore hurriedly prepared lunch, not wanting to face danger on an empty stomach. I had barely finished drying the last saucer, when the rocket began to pitch and heave in every direction, till all the objects not adequately tied down went flying from wall to wall like hail. With difficulty, I crawled over the armchair, and after I latched myself to, the, to it, as the ship tossed about with ever-increasing violence, I noticed a sort of pale lilac haze forming in the opposite side of the cabin, and in the middle of it, between the sink and the stove, a misty human shape, which had an apron on, was powering omelette butter into a frying pan. The shape looked at me with interest, but without surprise, then shimmered and was gone. I rubbed my eyes. I was obviously alone, so I attributed the vision to momentary aberration. As I continued to sit, or rather jump along with the armchair, it suddenly hit me like a dazzling revelation that this hadn't been a hallucination at all. A thick volume of the general theory of relativity came whirling past my chair, and I grabbed it for it, finally catching it on the fourth pass. <clears throat> Turning the pages of that heavy tome wasn't easy under the circumstances. Awesome forces hurled the rocket this way and that. It reeled like a drunken thing. But at last I found the right chapter. It spoke of the manifestation of the time loop, that is, the bending of the direction of the flow of time, in the presence of gravitational fields of great intensity, which phenomenon might even on occasion lead to complete reversal of time and the duplication of the present. The vortex I had just entered was not one of the most powerful ones. I knew that if I could turn the ship's bow, even only a little, towards the galactic pole, it would intersect with the so-called Vortex Gravitatiusus Picanbaci, in which it had been observed more than once the duplication or even triplication of the present. True, the controls were out, but I went down to the engine room and fiddled with the instruments. Oh yeah, this is going to be... Uh... This is going to be uh, probably the OG time uh, time loop experience that have uh, would have given rise to all of the time loop episodes on Star Trek New Generation and whatnot. True, the controls were out, but I went down to the engine room and fiddled with the instruments so long that I actually managed to produce a slight deflection of the rocket toward the dark galactic pole. This took several hours. The results were beyond my expectations. The ship fell into the center of the vortex at around midnight. Its girders shook and groaned until I began to, tear, to fear for its safety. But it emerged from its ordeal hole and once again was wrapped in the lifeless arms of the cosmic silence, whereupon I left the engine room only to see myself sound asleep in bed.
I realized at once that this was where I of the previous day. That is from Monday night. Without reflecting on the philosophical side of this uh, rather singular event, I ran over and shook the sleeper by the shoulder, shouting for him to get up, since I had no idea how long this Monday existence would last in my Tuesday one. Therefore, it was imperative we go outside and fix the rather as quickly as possible together. But the sleeper merely opened one eye and told me that not only I was rude, but didn't exist, being a figment of his dream, and nothing more. I tugged at him in vain, losing patience, and even attempted to drag him bodily from the bed. We wouldn't budge, he wouldn't budge stubbornly, repeating that it was all a dream. I began to curse, but he pointed out logically that bolts tightened in the dreams wouldn't hold on rather since sober light of day. I gave my word of honor that he was mistaken. I pleaded and swore in turn to no avail. Even the words did not convince him. He turned his back to me and started snoring. I sat down in the armchair to collect my thoughts and take stock of the situation. I'd lived through it twice now, first as that sleeper on Monday, and then as the one trying to wake him unsuccessfully on Tuesday. The Monday me hadn't believed in the reality of the duplication, while the Tuesday me already knew it to be a fact. Here was a perfect ordinary loop, time loop. What, then, should be done in order to get the rudder fixed? Since Monday me slept on, I remembered that on that night I slept through the morning undisturbed, I saw the futility of any further efforts to rouse him. The map indicated a number of other large gravitational vortices ahead, therefore I could count on the duplication of the present within the next few days. I decided to write, write myself a letter and pin it on the pillow, enabling the Monday me, when he awoke, to see for himself that the dream has been no dream. <coughs> More water. But no sooner did I sit at the table with a pen and paper than something started rattling in the engines, so I hurriedly hurried there and powered water on the overheated atomic pile till dawn, while the Monday me slept soundly, licking his lips from time to time, which galled me to no end. Hungry and bleary-eyed, for I hadn't slept a wink, I set about making breakfast, and was just wiping the dishes when the rocket fell into the next gravitational vortex. I saw my Monday self staring at me dumbfounded, lashed to the armchair, while on Tuesday, while Tuesday I fried an omelette. Then a lurch knocked me off balance. Everything grew dark and I, down I went. I came to on the floor among bits of broken china. Near my face were the shoes of a man standing over me. Get up, he said, lifting me. Are you all right? I think so, I answered, keeping my hands to the floor, on the floor, for my head was still spinning. From what day of the week are you? Wednesday, he said. Come on, let's get that rather fixed while we have the chance. But where's the Monday me? I asked. Gone. Which means I suppose that you are he. How is that? Well, the Monday me on Monday night became Tuesday morning and Tuesday me and so on. I don't understand. Doesn't matter. You'll get the hang of it. But hurry up, we're wasting time. J just a minute, I replied, remaining on the floor. Today is Tuesday. Now, if you are the Wednesday me, and if by that time on the Wednesday the rudder still hadn't been fixed, <clears throat> still hadn't been fixed, then it follows that something will prevent us from fixing it, since otherwise you on Wednesday would now and would not know on Tuesday be asking me to help you fix it. Wouldn't it be best then for us not to risk going outside? Nonsense! He exclaimed. Look, I'm the Wednesday me, and you're the Tuesday me. And as for the rocket, well, my guess is that um, its existence is patched with means that, in uh, which means that it places its Tuesday and in places its Wednesday. <coughs> and here and there, perhaps there is even a bit of Thursday. Time has simply become shuffled up in passing through these vortices, but why should that concern us when we're together? When together we are two, and therefore have a chance to fix the rudder. No, you're wrong. I said. If on Wednesday, where you already are, having lived through all the Tuesday, so that now Tuesday is behind us. On if on Wednesday, I repeat, the rudder isn't fixed, then one can only conclude that it didn't get fixed on Tuesday, since it's Tuesday now, and we were to go and fix the rudder right away. That right away would be your yesterday, and there would be no nothing to fix, and consequently, 
and consequently you're as stubborn as a mule, he growled. You'll regret this, and my only consolation is that you will too be infuriated by your own pig-headedness, just as I am now. When you yourself reach Wednesday. Ah, wait, I cried. Do you mean that on Wednesday I, being you, will try to convince the Tuesday me, just as you are doing here, except that everything will be reversed, in other words, you will be me and I will be you? Uh, but of course, that not makes a time loop. Hold on, I'm coming, yes, it makes sense now. <coughs> but before I could get up off the floor, uh, we fell into a new vortex and a terrible acceleration flattened dust against the ceiling. The dreadful pitching and heaving didn't let up once throughout that night from Tuesday to Wednesday. Then, when things had finally quieted down a little, the volume of the general theory of relativity came flying across the cabin and hit me on the forehead with such force that I lost consciousness. When I opened my eyes, I saw broken dishes and a man sprawled among them. I immediately jumped to my feet and lifted him, shouting, Get up! Are you all right? I think so, he replied, blinking. From what day of the week are you? Wednesday, I said. Come on, let's get that rather fixed while we have the chance. But where's the Monday? he asked, sitting up. He had a black eye. Gone, I said. Which means that you are he. How is that? Well, the Monday me on Monday night became Tuesday morning, the Tuesday me, and so on. I don't understand. It doesn't matter, you'll get the hang of it. But hurry up, we are wasting time. Saying this, I was already looking around for the tools. Just a minute, he drawled, not budging an inch. Today is Tuesday. Now, if you are on the Wednesday, me, and if by that time on Wednesday the rudder still hasn't been fixed, then it follows that something will prevent us from fixing it, since otherwise you on Wednesday would not be asking me now on Tuesday to help you fix it. Wouldn't it be best then for us not to go outside? Nonsense, I yelled, losing my temper. Look, I'm the Wednesday me, you're the Tuesday me. And so we quarrelled in opposite roles, during which he did in fact drive me into a positive fury, for he persistently refused to help me fix the rudder, and it did no good calling him pig-headed and a stubborn mule. And when at last I managed to convince him, he we plunged into the next gravitational vortex. I was in a cold sweat, for the thought occurred to me that he might, we might now go around and around in, the time, in this time loop, repeating ourselves for all eternity, but luckily that did not happen. By the time the acceleration had slackened enough for me to stand, I was alone once more in the cabin. Apparently the localized existence of Tuesday, which until now had persisted in the vicinity of the sink, had vanished, becoming a part of this irretrievable past. I rushed over, the ma over to the map to find some nice vortex to which I could send the rockets as to, so as to bring about still another warp of time, and in that way obtain a helping hand. There was, in fact, one vortex quite promising, too, and by manipulating the engines with great difficulty I aimed the rocket to intersect it by the very centre. True, the configuration of the vortex was, according to the map, rather unusual. It had two foci, side by side. <clears throat> But by now, I was too desperate to concern myself with, with this anomaly. After several hours and bustling about in the engine room with my hands were filthy, so I went to wash them, seeing as there was plenty of time yet before I would be entering the vortex. The bathroom was locked. From inside came the sounds of someone gargling. Who's there? I hollered, taken aback. Me, replied a voice. Which me is that? Ion Tihe. From what day? Friday. What do you want? I wanted to wash my hands, I said mechanically, thinking meanwhile with the greatest intensity. It was the Wednesday evening, and he came from Friday, therefore the gravitational vortex into which the ship was to fall would bend time from Friday to Wednesday, but for, but as for what then would take place within the vortex, uh, that I could not, in no way picture. Particularly intriguing was the question, of where Tuesday the Thursday might be. In the meantime, the Friday me still wasn't letting me into the bathroom, talking his, taking his sweet time, though I pounded on the door insistently. Stop that gargling! I roared out of patience. Every second is precious. Come out at once, we have to fix rather. Uh, for that you don't need me, he said phlegmatically from behind the door. The Thursday me must be around here somewhere and go with him. <coughs> 
W what Thursday me? That's not possible. I ought to know whether it's possible or not, considering the fact that I'm already in Friday. And they consequently have lived through your Wednesday as well this Thursday. Feeling dizzy, I jumped back from the door, for yes, I did hear some commotion in the cabin. A man was standing there, pulling the tool bag from under the bed. You're the Thursday me, I cried, running into the room. Right, he said. Here, give me a hand. <clears throat> Will we be able to fix the rudder this time? I asked as together we pulled the heavy sa pulled out the heavy satchel. I don't know. It wasn't fixed on Thursday. How's the Friday me? That hasn't crossed my mind. I quickly ran back to the bathroom door. Hey, there, Friday me. Has the rudder been fixed? Not on Friday, he replied. Why not? This is why not, he said, opening the door. His head was wrapped in a towel, and he pressed the flat of a knife to his forehead, trying to, in this manner to reduce the swelling of a lamp on the size of an egg. The Thursday me, meanwhile, approached with the tools and stood beside me, calmly scrutinizing me, then me, the me with the lamp, <clears throat> who, with his free hand, was putting back on a shelf a siphon of seltzer. So it was a it's gurgle, I heard, taken for his gargle. <clears throat> what gave you that? I asked sympathetically. Not what, who, he replied. It was the Sunday me. The Sunday me? But why? That can't be, I cried. Well, it's a long story. M makes no difference. Quick, let's go outside. We might just make it, said the Thursday me, turning to the me that was I. But the rocket will fall into the vortex any minute now, I replied. The shock could throw us off into space, and that would be the end of us. Use your head, stupid, snapped Tuesday. If the Friday is me alive, nothing can happen to us. Today is only the Thursday. It's Wednesday, I objected. It makes no difference. In either case, I'll be alive on Friday, and so will you. Yes, but there really aren't two of us in... Uh, it only looks that way, I observed. Actually, there is only one me, just from different days of the week. Fine, fine. Now open that hatch. But it turned out to be that we only had one spacesuit between us. Uh, therefore, we could not both leave the rocket at the same time, and therefore our plan to fix the rudder was completely ruined. Blast! I cried angrily, throwing down the tool bag. What I should have done is put on the spacesuit and to begin with and kept it on. I just didn't think of it. But you, as the Thursday me, you ought to have remembered. I had the spacesuit, but the Friday me took it. He said, when? Why? Uh, it's not worth going into, he shrugged, and turning back, uh, turning around, went back to the cabin. The Friday me wasn't there. I looked into the bathroom, but it was empty too. Where's the Friday me? I asked, returning. The Thursday me methodically cracked an egg with a knife and powered its contents to the sizzling fat. Somewhere in the neighborhood of Saturday, no doubt, he replied, indifferently, quickly scrambling the egg. Excuse me, I protested. But you already had your meals on Wednesday. Oh yeah, it's solely meant to be very confusing. Uh, that's the joke. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, I protested, but you already had your meals on Wednesday. What makes you think you can go and eat a second Wednesday supper? These rations are mine just as much as they are yours, he said, calmly lifting the brown edge of the egg with his knife. I am you, you are me, so it makes no difference. What sophistry? Wait, wh that's too much butter. Are you crazy? I don't have enough food for this many people. The skillet flew out of his hand, and I went crashing into the wall. We had fallen into a new vortex. Once again, the ship shook as if in a fever, but only thought was to get to the corridor where the spacesuit was hanging and put it on. For in that way, I reasoned, when Wednesday became Thursday, I, as the Thursday me, would be wearing that spacesuit, and if only I didn't take it off for a single minute, and I was determined not to, then I would obviously be wearing it on Friday also. And therefore, the me on Thursday and the me on Friday would both be in our spacesuits, so that when we came together in the present, uh, it would finally be possible to fix that miserable rudder. The increasing thrust of gravity made my head swim, and when I opened my eyes, I noticed that I was lying to the right of Thursday me, and not to the left, as I had been a few moments before. 
Now, while it has been easy enough for me to develop this plan about the spacesuit, it was considerably more difficult to put it into action, since with the growing gravitation, I could hardly move. When it weakened just a little, I began to inch my way across the floor in the direction of the door that led to the corridor. Meanwhile, I noticed that the first Amy was likewise heading for that door, crawling on his belly toward the corridor. At last, after about an hour, when the vortex had reached its widest point, we met at the threshold, both flattened to the floor. Then I thought, why should I have to strain myself to reach the handle? Let the first Amy do it. Yet, at the same time, I began to recall certain things which clearly indicated that it was an I now who was first Amy and not he. What day of the week are you? I asked to make sure. With my chin pressed to the floor, I looked him in the eye. Struggling, he opened his mouth. First day me, he groaned. Now, that was odd. Could it be that in spite of everything, I was still the Wednesday me? Calling to mind all my recollections of the recent past, I had to conclude that this was out of the question. So he must have been the Friday me, for he had preceded me by a day before, and then he was certainly a day ahead of now. I waited for him to open the door, but apparently he expected the same of me. The gravitational and uh, the gravitation had now subsided noticeably, so I got up and ran to the corridor. Just as I grabbed the spacesuit, it tripped me, pulling out my hand, and I fell flat on my face. <laughs> there is an illustration of the uh, time loop. Um, I guess by Lem himself. You dog, I cried, tricking your own self, that's really low. He ignored me, stepping calmly into the spacesuit. The shamelessness of it was appalling. Suddenly, a strange force threw him from the suit. As it turned out, someone was already inside. For a moment, I wavered, no longer knowing who was who. You, Wednesday, called the one in the spacesuit. Hold back Thursday, help me. For the Thursday me was indeed trying to tear the spacesuit off of him. Give me the spacesuit, bellowed the first day me as he wrestled with the other. Get off! What are you doing, going, trying to do? Don't you realize I'm the one who should have it and not you? howled the other one. And why is that, pray? For the reason, fool, that I'm closer to the Saturday than you, and by Saturday there will be two of us in suits. But that's ridiculous, I said, getting into their argument. As be at best, you'll be alone in the suit on Saturday, like an absolute idiot, and won't be able to do a thing. Let me have the suit. I put it on now, and then you'll be wearing it on Friday, as the Friday me, and I will also on Saturday, as the Saturday me, and so, you see, there will be two of us, and with suits. This lamp that I'm using for lighting is also um, <laughs> giving off heat. Um, so that's probably also why I'm so dry. <clears throat> okay. Uh... Come on, Thursday, give me a hand. W wait, protested the f Friday me when I forcibly yanked the space off his back. In the first place, there is no one here for you to call Thursday since midnight had passed and you are now Thursday me. And in the second place, it will be better if I stay in the spacesuit. The spacesuit won't do you a bit of good. Why, why not? If I put it on th today, we have to go. Uh, we have it on tomorrow too. <coughs> You'll see for yourself. After all, I was already you on Thursday, and my Thursday had passed, so I ought to know. Enough talk. Let go this instance. I snarled. But he grabbed it from me, and ch I chased him first through the engine room and then into the cabin. It somehow worked out that there were only two of us now. Suddenly I understood why the first day me, when we were standing at the hatch with the tools, had told me that the Friday me took his spacesuit from him. For in the meantime, I myself had become the first day me, and here the Friday me was in fact taking it. But I had no intention of giving in uh, that easily. Just you wait, I thought. I'll take care of you, and I, out I ran into the corridor, and from there to the engine room, <clears throat> where before, during the chase, I had noticed a heavy pipe lying to them on the floor, which served to stoke the atomic pile, and I picked it up, 
Thus armed, I dashed back to the cabin. The other me was already in the spacesuit, and he had pulled on everything but the helmet. Out of the spacesuit, I snapped, clenching my pipe in a threatening manner. Not a chance. Out, I say! Then I wondered whether I or not I should hit him. It was a little disconcerting, the fact that he had neither a black eye nor a bump on his head, like the other Friday me, the one that I'd found in the bathroom, but all at once I realized that this was the way it had to be. That Friday me was by now the Saturday me, yes, and perhaps even was knocking about somewhere in the vicinity of Sunday, while this Friday me <coughs> inside the spacesuit had only recently been Thursday me, into which the same Thursday me... Oh, we've got a second viewer. Hello. Um, anyway, yeah. Uh, being the Thursday me, into which same Thursday me, I myself had been transformed at midnight. Thus I was moving along the sloping curve of the time loop towards the place in which the Friday me becomes before the beating would change into Friday me already beaten. Still, he did say back then that it had been the Sunday me who did it, and there was no trace as of yet of him. We stood alone in the cabin. Uh, he and I. Then suddenly I had a brainstorm. Out of the spacesuit, I growled. Keep off, Thursday, he yelled. <clears throat> I'm not Thursday, I'm the Sunday me, I shrieked, closing in for the kill. He tried to kick me, but spacesuit boots are very heavy, and before he could raise his leg, I let him have it over the head. Not too hard, of course, since I had grown sufficiently familiar with all of this to know that I in, I, in turn, when eventually I went from Thursday to Friday me, would be on the receiving end, and I wasn't particularly set on fracturing my own skull. The Friday me fell with a groan, holding his head, and I brutally tore the spacesuit off of him, while he made for the bathroom on wobbly legs, muttering, Where's the cotton? Where's the seltzer? I quickly began to don the suit that uh, he, we struggled over until I noticed, sticking, <clears throat> sticking out from under the bed, a human foot. I took a closer look, kneeling. Under the bed lay a man. Trying to muffle the sounds of his chewing, he was hardly bolting down the last bar of milk chocolate I had stored away in the suitcase for a rainy side real day. The bastard was in such a hurry that he ate the chocolate along with the bits of tinfoil which glittered on his lips. Leave that chocolate alone, I yelled, pulling his foot. Who are you anyway? The first day me? I addressed in a lower voice, seized by a sudden doubt, for the thought occurred to me that maybe I already was Friday me and would soon have to collect what I had dished out earlier the same day. The Sunday me, he mumbled, his mouth full. I felt weak. Now, either he was lying, in which case there was nothing to worry about, or telling the truth, and if he was, I faced a clobbering, for sure, because the Sunday me, after all, was the one who had hit Friday me. The Friday me told me so myself, himself, before it happened. And then later, I, impersonating the Sunday me, had let him have it with the pipe. But on the other hand, I said to myself, even if he's lying and not the Sunday me, it's still quite possible that he's a later me than me. And if he is a later me than me, he remembers everything that I do, and therefore already knows that I lied to the Friday me, and so could deceive me in a similar manner. Since what had been a spur-of-the-moment stratagem on my part was for him, by now simply a memory, a memory he could easily make use of. Meanwhile, as I remained in uncertainty... <clears throat> He had eaten the rest of the chocolate and crawled out from under the bed. If you're the Sunday me, where's your spacesuit? I cried, struck by a new thought. I'll have it in a minute, he said calmly, and then I noticed the pipe in his hand. The next thing I saw was a bright flash, like a few dozen supernovas going off at once, after which I had lost consciousness. I came to, sitting on the floor of the bathroom. Someone was banging on the door. I began to attend to my bruises and bumps, but he kept pounding away. It turned out to be me on the Wednesday. After a while I showed him my battered head, he went with the Thursday me for the tools, then there was a lot of running around and yanking of spacesuits. This too, in one way or another, managed to live through, and on Saturday morning I crawled under the bed to see if there was any chocolate left in the suitcase. Someone started pulling my foot as I ate the last bar, which I found underneath the shirts. 
I no longer knew just who this was, but hit him over the head anyhow. I pulled the spacesuit off of him and was going to put it on when the rocket fell into the next vortex. When I regained consciousness, the cabin was packed with people. There was barely enough elbow room. As it turned out, they were all of them, me, from different days, weeks, months, and one, so he said, was even from the following year. There were plenty with bruises and black eyes, and five among those presented had spacesuits on. But instead of immediately going out through the hatch and repairing the damage, they began to quarrel, argue, bicker, and debate. The problem was, who hit whom and when? The situation was complicated by the fact that there now had appeared the morning mees and the afternoon mees. I feared that if the things went on, it would soon be broken into minutes and seconds. And then, too, the majority of the me present would be were lying like mad. Uh, so that this day, to this day, I am not altogether sure who my hit and who hit me when that whole business took place triangularly between the Thursday and Friday and the Wednesday me, so all of whom I was in turn. My impression is that because I had lied to the Friday me, pretending to be its Sunday me, uh, ended up with one blow more than I should have going by the calendar. But I would prefer not to dwell any longer on those unpleasant memories. A man who for an entire week does nothing but hit himself over the head has little reason to be proud. Meanwhile, arguments continued. The sight of such inaction was wasting on pre of precious time, drove me to despair, while the rocket rushed on blindly straight ahead, plunging every now and then into another gravitational vortex. At last, the ones wearing spacesuits started slag slagging it out with, with the ones who were not. I tried to introduce some sort of order into the absolute chaos, and finally, after superhuman efforts, succeeded in organizing something that resembled a meeting, in which the one from the next year, having seniority, was elected chairman by acclamation. We then appointed an elective, co appointed an elective committee, a nominating committee, and a committee for new business, and four of us from next month were made sergeants at arms. But in the meantime, we had passed through negative vorti vortex, which cut our number in half, so that the very first ballot we lacked a quorum and had to change the bylaws before proceeding to vote on the candidates for rudder repair. For the map indicated the approach of still other vortices, and these undid all that we had accomplished so far. First, the candidates already chosen disappeared, and then on the Tuesday me showed up with the Friday me, who had his head wrapped in a towel, and they created a shameful scene. Upon passing through a particularly strong positive vortex, we hardly fit in the cabin and corridor, and opening the hatch was out of the question. There simply wasn't room. Sorry. That's okay. But the worst of it was that these time displacements were increasing in amplitude. A few grey-haired me's had already appeared, and there, um, here and there, and even caught a glimpse of. Uh, and even caught a glimpse of those close-cropped heads of children. That is, of myself, of course, or rather myself, this from the halcyon days of boyhood. I can't really recall whether I was still on Sunday me, or had already turned into the Monday me. Not that it made any difference. Their children sobbed that they were being squashed in the crowd and they called for their mummy. The chairman, the Tiche from next year, let out a string of curses because the Wednesday me, who had crawled under the bed in a futile search for chocolate, bit him in the leg when he accidentally stepped on the latter's finger. <clears throat> I saw that all this would end badly, particularly now as there were grey beards and were turning up. Between the 120, 142nd and 143rd vortices, I passed around an attendance sheet, but afterwards it came to light that a large number of these presents were cheating, supplying false vital statistics. God knows why. Perhaps the prevailing atmosphere had muddled their wits. The noise and confusion were still that you could make yourself understood by the screaming at the top of your lungs. But then one of the last year's eons hit upon what seemed to be an excellent idea, namely that the oldest among us tell the story of his life. In that way, we would learn who was supposed to fix the rudder. For obviously the oldest me contained within his past experience the lives of all the others, the others there from the various months and days and years. So we turned in this matter to a hoary gold gentleman, gentleman who, slightly posied, was standing idly in the corner. <clears throat> 
When questioned, he began to speak at great length of his children and grandchildren, then passed to his cosmic voyages, and he had embarked upon no end of, of these of co in the course of his 90-some years. Of the one now taking place, the only one of interest to us, the old man had no recollection whatsoever, owing to his general sclerotic and overexcited condition. However, he was far too proud to admit this and went on evasively, obstinately, time and time again returning to his high connections, decorations and grandchildren, till finally he shouted, we shouted him down and ordered him to hold his tongue. The next two vortices cruelly thinned our ranks. After third, not only was there more room, but all of those but all of those in spacesuits had disappeared as well. One empty suit remained. We voted to hang it up in the corridor, and then went back to our deliberations. Then, following another scuffle for the possession of that precious garment, a new vortex came along, and suddenly the place was deserted. I was sitting on the floor, puffy-eyed in my strangely spacious cabin, surrounded by broken furniture, strips of clothing, ripped-up books. The floor was strewn with pallets. According to the map, I had now passed through the entire zone of gravitational vortices. No longer able to count on the duplications, and thus no longer able to correct the damage, I fell into numb despair. About an hour later, I looked out in the corridor and discovered to my great surprise that the spacesuit was missing. But when I vaguely remembered, yes, right before that last vortex, two little boys sneaked out into the corridor. Could they have possibly both of them put on the spacesuit? Struck by a sudden thought, I ran to the controls. They rather worked. So then, those little tykes had fixed it, after all, while the ado we adults were stuck in endless disagreements. I imagined that one of them placed his arms in the sleeves of the suit and the other one in the pants. Uh, that way they could have tightened the nut and bolt with the wrenches at the same time, working on either side of the rudder. The empty space that I found in the airlock, behind the hatch. I carried it inside uh, the rocket like a sacred relic, my heart full of boundless gratitude for those brave lads that I had been so long ago. And thus concluded what was surely the most unusual of my adventures. I reached my destination safely, thanks to the courage and resourcefulness I had displayed uh, when only two children. I was always afterwards, uh, I, I, it was said afterwards that I invented the whole thing, and those more malicious even went so far as to insinuate that I had a weakness for alcohol, carefully concealed on earth but freely indulged during those long and lonely cosmic flights. Lord only knows what other gossip had been circulating on the subject, but that it was that is how people are they willingly give credence to the most far-fetched drivel but not to the simple truth which is precisely what i have presented here right there we go that's the second voyage no that's the seventh voyage because there is no first voyage that's the 21st as well uh right okay i think my voice is going so i'm gonna finish for now and get back to it maybe next weekend depending on my how my shifts work because it's a mess and a half but yeah thanks for tuning in bye, bye.